All right, praise God. Good to see you, everybody. Another good day to be with you and talking about the things of God. And what, where we've got ourselves to so far is that Jewish war written by Josephus. And finally, we're going to see Josephus coming into the picture here. And he had been sent to Galilee, commissioned as a general by priests in Jerusalem. And so he has uh, put up a defense there. And what we've got coming in in book three is we have Vespasian and Titus finally coming into the picture. Now we've already seen that the whole countryside from south to north has been bloody. That's before Vespasian and Titus got there. So you can imagine seeing them come into the picture where 6,000 Roman soldiers, around that many, had been killed by the Jewish rebels there. And so this war could not be ceased, not by the Jewish leaders like King Herod Agrippa II and his sister Bernice, where they were pleading with tears, they couldn't stop it. They were driven out with stones and um, stuff was burnt. And so here we have Vespasian and Titus with 60,000 troops. So they got rid of 6,000. Well, they got 60,000 troops. So one eagle gone, but they got a whole flock of eagles coming towards that dead body already. And so we're going to see that happen and a few other things until Jatapata, where Josephus is doing his final defense where 40,000 of them are going to be killed and another 1,200 put into slavery. So Jatapata, that is um, where modern day Yodfat is that. That was established in 1960, but that's, uh, if you were looking for that place today, that's where it would be. All right, so let's look at this history and we'll jump right into book three, chapter one, section one. Nero sends Vespasian to punish the Jewish rebellion. Nero was informed of the Romans' ill success in Judea, a concealed consternation and terror, as is usual in such cases, fell upon him, although he openly looked very big. As he was deliberating to whom he should commit the care to the east, now it was in so great a commotion, and who might be best able to punish the Jews for the rebellion? and might prevent the same distemper from seizing upon the neighboring nations also. He found no one but Vespasian equal to the task. He was growing an old man, long ago pacified the West and made it subject to the Romans when it had been put into disorder by the Germans. He had also recovered them Britain by his arms. So Vespasian sent his son Titus from Achaia, where he had been with Nero, to Alexandria, to bring back with him from thence the 5th and the 10th legions. While he himself, when he had passed over the Helen spot, came by land into Syria, where he gathered together the Roman forces with a considerable number of auxiliaries from kings in that neighborhood. So Vespasian, he's gonna have uh, a lot of different auxiliaries, and some of them from King Agrippa himself, who was kicked out of Jerusalem. It's kind of funny how uh, Vespasian. Now, he had been raising mules, basically retired. He did not want to be in public life. He'd almost gotten serious trouble for falling asleep while Nero was doing his singing and acting also. So here we see Jews in zeal, blown up into flame, carried war to Ashkelon, where 18,000 are killed. The Jews, after they had beaten Cestius, were so much elevated with their unexpected success that they could not govern their zeal, but like people blown up into a flame by their good fortune, carried the war to remoter places. Accordingly, they presently got together a great multitude of all their most hardy soldiers and marched away for Ascalon, and was always an enemy to the Jews, on which account they determined to make their first efforts against it. The fight lasted till the evening, till 10,000 men of the Jews' side lay dead, with two of their generals, 
John and Silas, the greater part of the remainder, were wounded with Niger, their remaining general, who fled away together to a small city of Idumea called Salus. Some few also of the Romans were wounded in this battle. Now the Jews, they got together all their forces and came with greater fury and in much greater numbers to Ashkelon, but their former ill fortune followed them. As a consequence of their unskillfulness and other deficiency in war, Antonius laid ambushes for them in the passages they were to go through. They fell into snares unexpectedly and where they were encompassed about with horsemen before they could form themselves into a regular body for fighting and were above 8,000 of them slain. The rest of them ran away and with them Niger who still did a great many bold exploits in his flight. So there in looking at the map and following all these different cities and towns, you can see how that map just gets bloodier and bloodier as it goes. All right, let's look at Galilee overfilled with fire and blood, Vespasian and Titus with 60,000. Galilee was all over filled with fire and blood, nor was it exempted from any kind of misery or calamity. For the only refuge they had was this, that when they were pursued, they could retire to the cities which had walls built them by Josephus. So Josephus had prior to this, and I'm just taking sections out of the book, and you can read it fully, but he had gone through different places through Galilee and fortifying these cities, building up the walls and uh, different things he was doing in governance. Section two. Titus, he sailed over from Achaia to Alexandria. He came suddenly to Ptolemais, and there finding his father, together with the two legions, the fifth and the tenth, which were the most eminent legions of all. He joined them to that fifteenth legion, which was with his father. Eighteen cohorts followed these legions. There came also five cohorts from Caesarea, with one troop of horsemen, and five other troops of horsemen from Syria. Now these ten cohorts had severally a thousand footmen, but the other 13 cohorts had no more than 6,000 footmen apiece with 120 horsemen. There were also a considerable number of auxiliaries got together that came from King Antiochus and Agrippa and Soamus, each of them contributing a thousand footmen that were archers and a thousand horsemen. Malchus also, the king of Arabia, sent a thousand horsemen besides five thousand footmen, the greatest part of which were archers, so that the whole army, including the auxiliaries sent by the kings, as well horsemen as footmen, when all were united together, amounted to sixty thousand beside the servants, who, as they followed, in vast numbers. Now this is kind of interesting here, this next section, because it's kind of interesting to see what the Roman soldiers, how they conducted themselves and how they were prepared for battle. So let's look at section five. They all march without noise and in decent manner, and everyone keeps his own rank as if they were going to war. The footmen are armed with breastplates and headpieces and have swords on each side. The sword which is upon their left side is much longer than the other, for that on the right side is not longer than a span. Those footmen also that are chosen out from the rest to be about the general himself have a lance and a buckler. But the rest of the foot soldiers, they have a spear and a long buckler beside a saw and a basket, a pickaxe and an ax, a thong of leather and a hook with provisions for three days so that a footman hath no great need of a mule to carry his burdens. The horsemen have a long sword on their right side and a long pole in their right hand. A shield also lies by them obliquely on one side of their horses, with three or more darts that are borne in their quiver, having a broad point and not smaller than spears. They have also headpieces and breastplates, in like manner as have all the footmen. Those chosen to be about the general, their armor no way differs from that of horsemen belonging to other troops. And he always leads the legions forth, to whom the lot assigns that employment. And we'll skip up to section seven. They so manage their preparatory exercises of their weapons that not the bodies of the soldiers only, but their souls may also become stronger. 
they are moreover hardened for war by fear. For their laws inflict capital punishments, not only for soldiers running away from the ranks, but for slothfulness and inactivity, though it be but in a lesser degree, as are their generals more severe than their laws. For they prevent any imputation of cruelty toward those under condemnation, by their great rewards they bestow on the valiant soldiers. And the readiness of obeying their commanders is so great that it is very ornamental in peace, but when they come to battle, the whole army is but one body. So well coupled together are their ranks, so sudden are their turning abouts, so sharp their hearing as to what orders are given them, so quick their sight of their ensigns, and so nimble are their hands when they set to work. Whereby it comes to pass that what they do is done quickly, and what they suffer they bear with the greatest patience. Praise God! They are ready, ready for warfare, just like the body of Christ is one body, always listening, always supple to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. All right, let's look at the next section. Vespasian to Galilee, Joseph flees from Gerus near Sephora to Tiberias. So this is book three, chapter six, section three. And thus did Vespasian march with his army and came to the bounds of Galilee where he pitched his camp and restrained his soldiers, who were eager for war. He also showed his army to the enemy in order to affright them, and to afford them a season for repentance, to see whether they would change their minds before it came to battle. And at the same time, he got things ready for besieging their strongholds. Those that were in Josephus' camp, which was at the city called Gerus, not far from Sephora, when they heard that war was come near them, and that the Romans would suddenly fight them hand to hand, dispersed themselves and fled, not only before they came to the battle, but before the enemy ever came in sight, while Josephus and a few others were left behind. And as he saw that he had not an army sufficient to engage the enemy, that the spirits of the Jews were sunk, and that the greater part would willingly come to terms, if they might be credited. He already despaired of the success of the whole war, and determined to get as far as he possibly could out of danger. So he took those that stayed along with him and fled to Tiberias. So it's just kind of neat looking at the map and seeing the different places of engagements. So here we see Vespasian's going to kill some youth at Gadara and enslave some others. Chapter 7, Section 1. Vespasian marched to the city Gadara and took it upon the first onset because he found it destitute of any considerable number of men grown up and fit for war. He came then into it and slew all the youth, the Romans having no mercy on any age whatsoever. And this was done out of the hatred they bore the nation and because of the iniquity they had been guilty of in the affair of Cestius. He also set fire not only to the city itself, but to all the villas and small cities that were round about it. Some of them were quite destitute of inhabitants, and out of some he carried the inhabitants as slaves into captivity. So you can see and imagine, you know, coming into a place where Cestius had tried to stop the rebellion, but they end up driving him out and killing like around 6,000 troops. So you can see why they are hesitant to give uh, seeing the circumstances they got put into but still they were looking for repentance but uh, people are not wanting to repent but continue into warfare all right section two Josephus despairs of successive war and sends word to Jerusalem as to Josephus his retiring to that city which he chose as the most fit for his security put it into great fear for the people of Tiberias did not imagine that he would have run away unless he had entirely despaired of the success of the war. Indeed, as to that point, they were not mistaken about his opinion, for he saw whither the affairs of the Jews would tend at last, and was sensible that they had but one way of escaping, and that was by repentance. He expected Romans would forgive him, yet chose to die many times over, rather than to betray his country, and to dishonor that supreme command of the army which had been entrusted with him or to live happily under those against whom he had set to fight. He determined, therefore, to give exact account of affairs to principal men at Jerusalem, 
He also sent word that if they thought of coming to terms, they must suddenly answer, or if resolved on war, they must send an army sufficient to fight the Romans. Accordingly, he wrote these things and sent messengers immediately to carry his letter to Jerusalem. Those at Jerusalem have to make a decision and make it quick to get it back to Josephus. Otherwise, they are not going to have a turn that they can make but they will be put in a situation of battling, which it's gonna end up taking a major troops that Jerusalem would depend on and um, many other people down with it too because there are a lot of people in Jatapata, 40,000, more than 40,000. All right, section three. Vespasian was very desirous of demolishing Jatapata. For he had gotten intelligence that the greatest part of the enemy had retired there, a place of great security to them, and he sent footmen and horsemen to level the road, which was mountainous and rocky. So it was absolutely impractical for horsemen. Workmen accomplished what they were about in four days' time and opened a broad way for the army. Well, all right, sounds like they got the sea bees with them. On the fifth day, Josephus prevented him and came from Tiberias and went to Jatapata and raised the drooping spirits of the Jews. A certain deserter told this good news to Vespasian that Josephus had removed himself there, which made him make haste to the city, as supposing that with taking that he should take all Judea, and believed it to be brought about by the providence of God, that he who appeared to be the most prudent man in all their enemies had, of his own accord shut himself up in a place of sure custody. So if you look just west of the Sea of Galilee, uh, I put a star around that, you can see Jatapata right there. Section nine, Vespasian set the engines for throwing stones and darts round about the city. The number of the engines was in all 160 and bid them fall to work and dislodge those that were on the wall. At once lances upon them with a great noise and stones of the weight of a talent were thrown by the enemies together with fire and a vast multitude of arrows which made the wall so dangerous that the Jews durst not only not come upon it for the multitude of the Arabian archers as well also as all of those that threw darts and slung stones fell to work at the same time with the engines. Then they made sallies out of the city like private robbers by parties and pulled away the hurdles that covered the workmen and killed them when they were thus naked. And when those workmen gave way, these cast away the earth that composed the bank and burnt the wooden parts of it together with the hurdles. Till at length Vespasian perceived intervals between the workers was of disadvantage to him. Spaces of ground afforded Jews a place for assaulting Romans he united the hurdles and joined one part of the army to the other, which prevented the private excursions of the Jews. Well, what's interesting about this, that hearing about these stones that are coming and hurled at them, the weight of a talent. Now we see this in Revelation 16 with the seven bowls. So this, uh, where we see that, you see great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Well, also, when the Romans had gone from the Mount of Olives with the 10th Roman Legion, they were catapulting in actually white stones. So when we see this in Revelations, um, it's kind of interesting how we can see that that seventh bowl, you see, down at the bottom on the left side out of the temple of heaven from the throne it is done you see the city divided in three and the hail the weight of a talent and they blasphemed god well they were surely blaspheming god at the temple when their 10th roman legion was at the mount of olives but that's interesting also interesting to note is that in revelations it said the city would be divided in three well you had eliezer you had John of Gishala, and you had Simon Bargiora, those three Jewish heads fighting one another in Jerusalem and even at the temple, killing one another and fighting against the people. And so 
that's just interesting to see that. All right, let's get back to section 10. Josephus uses raw oxides as shields to build wall higher at Jatapata. The bank, now raised and brought nearer than ever to the battlements that belonged to the walls, Josephus got together his workmen and ordered them to build the walls higher. They said that this was impossible to be done while so many darts were thrown at them. He invented this sort of cover for them. He bid them to fix piles and expand before them the raw hides of oxen newly killed, yielding and hollowing themselves when stones were thrown at them that they might receive them, for that the darts would slide off them and the fire thrown would be quenched by the moisture that was in them. These he set before the workmen, and under them these workmen went on with their works in safety and raised the walls higher, and that both by day and night fill it was 20 cubits high. He also built a good number of towers upon the wall and fitted it to strong battlements. This greatly discouraged the Romans, who in their own opinions were already gotten within the walls, while they were now at once astonished at Josephus's contrivances and at the fortitude of the citizens that were in the city. Documentaries that I've seen people do on Josephus, they do not count him as a good general. But here I'm seeing Josephus come up with different tactics, even though there was no way he was going to win against the Romans. But to, what, what's it say, greatly discourage the Romans. This is a mighty warrior, a mighty general that is leading the troops, encouraging the rest of the city. I mean, they need encouragement and they are shown strong that the Romans with everything they have are very impressed with Josephus as a general and we'll see more. Section 13, Vespasian ceased efforts at wall to wait for a loss of water and Josephus ties wet clothes to the walls, discouraging Vespasian. Vespasian hoped their receptacles of water would in no long time be emptied and they would be forced to deliver up the city. Josephus, being minded to break such this hope, gave command that they should wet a great many clothes and hang them out about the battlements till the entire wall was of a sudden all wet with the running down of water. At this sight, Romans were discouraged and under consternation when they saw them able to throw away in sport so much water, when they supposed them not to have enough to drink themselves. This made the Roman general despair of taking the city by their want of necessaries, and to betake himself again to arms, and to try to force them to surrender, which was what the Jews greatly desired, for as they despaired of either themselves or their city being able to escape, they preferred a death in battle before one by hunger and thirst. Section 14, dressed in sheepskin, disguised as dogs, and sending letters. Josephus contrived another stratagem, beside the foregoing, to get plenty of what they wanted. There was a certain rough and uneven place that could hardly be ascended, and on the account was not guarded by the soldiers. So Josephus sent out certain persons along the western parts of the valley, and by them sent letters to whom he pleased of the Jews that were out of the city, and procured from them what necessaries soever they wanted in the city in abundance. He enjoyed them also to creep generally along by the watch as they came into the city, and to cover their backs with such sheepskins as had their wool upon them, that if anyone should spy them out in the night time, they might be believed to be dogs. This was done till the watch perceived their contrivances and encompassed that rough place about themselves. Now see, this is pretty smart of Josephus, isn't it? It's amazing the things that he could do as a general. You gotta be thinking ahead, you gotta be creative, and you gotta not give up. So that's what we're gonna continue to see with Josephus as a general. Section 17. Josephus resolved to stay at Jatapata and fight till the end. Josephus thought that if he resolved to stay, it would be ascribed to their entreaties, and if he resolved to go away by force, he should be put into custody. His commiseration also of the people under their lamentations had much broken his eagerness to leave them. So he resolved to stay, and arming himself with the common despair of the citizens, he said to them, now is the time to begin to fight in earnest when there's no hope of deliverance left. It is a brave thing to prefer glory before life and to set about some such 
noble undertaking as may be remembered by late posterity. He fell to work immediately and made a sally and dispersed the enemy's out guards and ran as far as the Roman camp itself pulled the coverings of their tents to pieces that were upon their banks and set fire to their works. This was the manner in which he never left off fighting, neither the next day nor the day after it, but went on with it for a considerable number of both days and nights. Yeah, see the perseverance of Josephus. And then this next one is really brilliant uh, as a general in coming up against the Romans. All right, let's take a look at this in section 20. Josephus deflects blows of the battering rams. He burns the Roman machines. Josephus saw this ram battering the same place and that the wall would quickly be thrown down by it. And he gave orders to fill sacks with shaft to hang them down before the place where they saw the ram battering. This contrivance delayed the attempts of the Romans because let them remove their engine to what part they pleased those that were above it removed their sacks and placed them over against the strokes it made, insomuch that the wall was no way hurt, this by diversion of the strokes, till the Romans made an opposite contrivance of long poles, by tying hooks at their ends, cut off the sacks. When the battering ram thus recovered its force, the wall, having been newly built, was giving away. They took what materials they had that were dry and made a sally three ways, set fire to the machines, the hurdles, the banks of the Romans themselves, nor did the Romans well know how to come to their assistance, being at once under a consternation at the Jews' boldness, and being prevented by the flames for the materials being dry with the bitumen and the pitch that were among them, as was the brimstone also. The fire caught hold of everything immediately, and what cost the Romans a great deal of pains was in one hour consumed. I just think that is brilliant to see Josephus coming up with these tactics that that's a great fighter that even when you know you are facing that in the end you're not going to be successful to continue strong all the way to the end and think about how we in the Lord are called to continue strong to the end Though they may kill the body, it's God himself that can take out the body and the soul, but we have everlasting life in Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at section 21. Let's look at the courage and the boldness of the Jews at Jatapata. We have Eliezer, Natir, and Philip. A certain Jew, worthy of our relation and commendation, the son of Samias. Eliezer, born in Saab in Galilee, this man took up a stone of vast bigness and threw it down from the wall upon the ram. This was so great a force that it broke off the head of the engine. He leaped down, took up the head of the ram from the midst of them, and without any concern carried it to the top of the wall, while he stood as a fit mark to be pelted by all the enemies. Accordingly, he received the strokes upon his naked body and was wounded with five darts nor did he mind any of them while he went up to the top of the wall, where he stood in the sight of them all, as an instance of the greatest boldness, after which he threw himself on a heap with his wounds upon him and fell down together with the head of the ram. Next to him, two brothers showed their courage. Their names were Natir and Philip, both of the village Ruma, Galileans also. These men leaped upon the soldiers of the 10th legion and fell upon the Romans with such a noise and force as to disorder their ranks and to put to flight all upon whomsoever they made their assaults. Wow, that is amazing, isn't it? To see people going brave clear to the end. And, you know, those who continue in Christ, you're going to be rewarded. And uh, we just have to continue faithful until the end to be a faithful servant what these guys had in their heart who knows god is going to have to judge the hearts we can't judge the hearts now we should be given righteous judgments the things of the kingdom of god are different than the worldly situations and uh, thinking about battle and the things of war it always reminds me of smedley butler the marine corps general who prior to World War II, he wrote a book, War is a Racket. So here he is, Medal of Honor, two times, and yet he writes a 
book, War is a Racket. Well, a lot of times war really is a racket, so people want to make some money. But what we have in the Lord is a different kind of warfare. This is a spiritual warfare, not against the carnal flesh, but a warfare where it is mighty in God, by the power of God for pulling down strongholds, right? All right, let's continue section 22. Josephus and the rest took a great deal of fire and burnt machines and coverings with the works belonging to the 5th and 10th legion, which they put to flight. When others followed them immediately and buried those instruments and all the materials underground, about the evening, Romans erected the battering ram again. A certain Jew that defended the city from the Romans hit Vespasian with a dart in his foot. This caused the greatest disorder among the Romans, for when those who stood near him saw his blood, they were disturbed at it, and a report went abroad through the whole army that the general was wounded, while the greatest part left the siege and came running together with surprise and fear to the general. Before them all came Titus. Out of the concern he had for his father, insomuch that the multitude were in great confusion, this out of the regard they had for their general, and by reason of the agony that the son was in. Yet did the father soon put an end to the son's fear, and to the disorder the army was under. For being superior to his pains, endeavoring soon to be seen by all that had been in the fright about him, he excited them to fight the Jews more briskly. For now everybody was willing to expose himself to danger immediately, to avenge their general. They encouraged one another with loud voices and ran hastily to the walls. Section 23, the force of the Roman machines, Jews at Jatapata fall manfully and the wall yielding. Josephus and those with him, although they fell down dead, yet did not they desert the wall. Engines could not be seen at a great distance, so what was thrown at them was hard to be avoided. The force with which these engines threw stones and darts made them hurt several at a time. They carried away the pinnacles of the wall and broke off the corners of the towers. One that stood around about Josephus near the wall, his head was carried away by such a stone. His skull was flung as far as three furlongs. In the daytime also, a woman with child had her belly so violently struck, the infant was carried to the distance of half a furlong, so great was the force of the engine. The noise of the instruments themselves was very terrible. The sound of the darts and the stones that were thrown by them was so also. Of the same sort was that noise that dead bodies made when they were dashed against the wall. Indeed, dreadful was the clamor which these things raised in the women within the city, which was echoed back at the same time by the cries of such as were slain, while the whole space of ground whereupon they fought ran with blood. And the wall might have been ascended over by the bodies of the dead carcasses. The mountains also contributed to increase the noise by the echoes. Nor was there at that night anything of terror wanting that could either affect the hearing or the sight. Yet did a great part of those that fought so hard for Jatapata fall manfully, as were a great part of them wounded. However, the morning watch was come ere the wall yielded to the machines employed against it though it had been battered without intermission. However, those within covered their bodies with their armor and raised works over against that part which was thrown down before those machines were laid by which the Romans were to ascend into the city. Section 28, Scalding Oil Under the Roman Armor. Then did Josephus take necessity for his counselor in the utmost distress, which necessity is very sagacious in invention, when it is irritated by despair gave orders to pour scalding oil upon those whose shields protected them, whereupon they soon got it ready, being many that brought it, and what they brought being a great quantity also. They poured it on all sides upon the Romans, and threw down upon them their vessels as they were still hissing from the heat of the fire. This so burnt the Romans that it dispersed that united band, who now tumbled down from the wall with horrid pains. For the oil did easily run down the whole body from head to foot, under their entire armor, and fed upon their flesh like flame itself, its fat and unctuous nature rendering it soon heated and slowly cooled. As the men were cooped up in their headpieces and breastplates, they could no way get free from the burning oil. 
only leap and roll about in their pains as they fell down from the bridges they had laid, beaten back, retired to their own party, who still pressed them forward. They were easily wounded by those that were behind them. How good is this of Josephus to be able to take a body that's united and disband it? And see, this is a tactic, uh, well, in warfare, this is a tactic. And we see it, I mean, in many countries, we see how those who want control in battle, sometimes they go against their own citizens, trying to disband them as a body and cause them to have division amongst themselves instead of being one body that can go forward with something good. Well, praise God, we just got to continue with the Lord for what he calls good, right? What is righteous by God. All right, section 29. Romans, although they saw their own men thrown down and in miserable condition, yet were they vehemently bent against those that poured the oil upon them. Jews made use of another stratagem to prevent their ascent. They poured boiling fenugreek upon the boards to make them slip and fall down, by which means neither could those that were coming up nor those that were going down stand on their feet. Some of them fell backwards upon the machines on which they ascended and were trodden upon. Many of them fell down upon the bank they had raised, and when they were fallen upon it, were slain by the Jews. For when the Romans could not keep their feet, the Jews, being freed from fighting hand to hand, had leisure to throw their darts at them. The general called off those soldiers in the evening that had suffered so sorely. The number of slain was not a few, while the wounded was still greater. Of the people of Jatapata, no more than six men were killed, although more than 300 carried off wounded. Wow, that's amazing. So during that time of pouring that oil, that really worked for them to keep the Jews safe but disband the enemy. All right, section 30. Vespasian erects three towers, covered in iron plate, and raises the banks higher. Well, Vespasian, he sir, certainly uh, doesn't give up either, does he? Vespasian comforted his army on occasion of what happened, and as he found them angry indeed, but rather wanting somewhat to do than any further exhortations, he gave orders to raise the bank still higher, to erect three towers, each 50 feet high, that they should cover them with plates of iron on every side, that they might be both firm by their weight, not easily liable to be set on fire. These towers he set upon the banks and placed upon them such as could shoot darts and arrows, with the lighter engines for throwing stones and darts also. Besides these, he set upon them the stoutest men among the slingers, who not being to be seen by reason of their height they stood upon, and the battlements that protected them might throw their weapons at those that were upon the wall, and were easily seen by them. Hereupon the Jews, not being easily able to escape those darts that were thrown down upon their heads, nor to avenge themselves on those whom they could not see, and perceiving that the height of the towers was so great that a dart which they threw with their hands could hardly reach it, and that the iron plates about them made it very hard to come at them by fire. They ran away from the walls and fled hastily out of the city and fell upon those that shot at them, and thus did the people of Jatapata resist the Romans. So I think this is great seeing these generals between Vespasian conducting the generalship here and Josephus both of them strong, both of them going forward, and neither one giving up. At the worst that they see from the other side, they continue to be innovative and to push forward. All right, let's look at section 31. Trajan with the 10th legion at Jaffa, 12,000 shut out of their city cursing. Vespasian sent out Trajan against Jaffa. Trajan, commander of the 10th legion, it was secured by a double wall. He joined battle with them. After a short resistance which they made, he pursued after them. As they fled to the first wall, the Romans followed them so closely they fell in together with them. But when the Jews were endeavoring to get again within their second wall, the fellow citizens shut them out, as being afraid that the Romans would force themselves in with them. It was certainly God, therefore, who brought the Romans to punish the Galileans, and did then expose the people of the city, every one of them manifestly to be destroyed by their bloody enemies. For they fell upon the gates in great crowds, 
earnestly calling to those that kept them, and that by their names also. Yet had they their throats cut in the very midst of their supplications. For the enemy shut the gates of the first wall, their own citizens shut the gates of the second. So they were enclosed between two walls and were slain. Many of them were run through by swords of their own men, many by their own swords, betrayed by their own friends, which quite broke their spirits. At last they died, cursing not the Romans, but their own citizens, till they were all destroyed, being in number 12,000. Trajan sent messengers to Vespasian to send his son Titus to finish the victory he had gained. He came quickly, set Trajan over the left wing while he had the right, and led them to the siege when the soldiers brought ladders to be laid against the wall on every side. The Galileans opposed them from above for a while. Then did Titus's men leap into the city, a fierce battle between them, for men of power fell upon the Romans in the narrow streets. And the women threw what silver came next to hand at them, and sustained a fight with them for six hours' time. But when the fighting men were spent, the rest of the multitude had their throats cut partly in the open air and partly in their own houses, both young and old together. So there were no males now remaining besides infants, which with the women were carried as slaves into captivity, so that the number of the slain both now in the city and the former fight, 15,000, and the captives were 2,130. All right, section 32, 11,600 Samaritans on Mount Gerizim slain by Cerealis upon not laying down arms. Nor did the Samaritans escape misfortunes. They assembled themselves together upon the mountain called Gerizim, which is with them a holy mountain. The courageous minds they showed could not be threatened somewhat of war, nor were they rendered wiser by their miseries that had come upon their neighboring cities. Vespasian thought it best to prevent their motions, to cut off the foundation of their attempts. The number of those that were come to Mount Gerizim and their conspiracy together give ground for fear what they would be at. He therefore sent Cerealis, the commander of the 5th Legion, with 600 horsemen and 3,000 footmen, who did not think it safe to go up to the mountain and give them battle, because many of the enemy were on the higher part of the ground. So he encompassed all the lower part of the mountain with his army. The Samaritans, who were now destitute of water, were inflamed with the violent heat, for it was summertime, the multitude had not provided themselves with necessaries, insomuch that some of them died that very day with heat, while others of them preferred slavery before such a death as that was, and fled to the Romans, by whom Cerealis understood that those which still stayed there were very much broken by their misfortunes. So he went up to the mountain, and having placed his forces round about the enemy, he, in the first place, exhorted them to take the security of his right hand, and come to terms with him, thereby save themselves, and assured them that if they would lay down their arms, he would secure them from any harm. When he could not prevail with them, he fell upon them and slew them all, being in number 11,600. So there, if we look west of the Jordan, you'll see Mount Gerizim under that, where it says Samaria, you'll see it with a star there, Mount Gerizim. We've got but three slides left in this Battle of Jatapata. So let's go now to section 33 of chapter 7 of book 3. A deserter tells of sleep at the last watch. Jatapata still held out manfully. They bore up under the miseries beyond all that could be hoped for. On the 47th day of the siege, banks cast up by the Romans were higher than the wall. On which day, a certain deserter went to Vespasian and told him how few were left in the city, how weak they were, and so worn out with perpetual watching and as perpetual fighting, that about the last watch of the night, when they thought they might have some rest from the hardships they were under, and when a morning sleep used to come upon them. Section 34, Titus leads the Roman army quietly into Jatapata under the cover of a mist. They marched without noise at the hour that had been told them to the wall. Titus first got upon it with one of his tribunes, Domitius Sabinus, and had a few of the 15th legion along with him. So they cut the throats of the watch and entered the city very quietly. After these came Cerellus, the tribune, and Placidus, and led on those that were under them. 
Now when the citadel was taken, and the enemy were in the very midst of the city, and when it was already day, yet was not the taking of the city known by those that held it. For a great many of them were fast asleep, and a great mist, which then by chance fell upon the city, hindered those that got up from distinctly seeing the case they were in, till the whole Roman army was gotten in, and they were raised up only to find the miseries they were under. And as they were slaying, they perceived the city was taken. And for the Romans, they remembered what they had suffered during the siege, that they spared none, nor pitied any. This provoked a great many, even of those chosen men that were about Josephus, to kill themselves with their own hands. For when they saw that they could kill none of the Romans, they resolved to prevent being killed by the Romans, and got together in great numbers in the utmost parts of the city, and killed themselves. Section 35, Jatapata taken, 40,000 killed, 1,200 captive, Antonius, a Roman killed. Romans might have boasted that the siege was without blood on their side, had not been a centurion, Antonius, who was slain at the taking of the city. His death was occasioned by the following treachery, for there was one of those that were fled into the caverns, which were a great number, who desired that this Antonius would reach him his right hand for his security, and would assure him that he would preserve him and give him his assistance in getting up out of the cavern. Accordingly, he incautiously reached him his right hand when the other man prevented him, stabbed him under his loins with a spear, and killed him immediately. On this day it was that the Romans slew all the multitude that appeared openly, but on the following days they searched the hiding places and fell upon those that were underground, in the caverns, and went thus through every age, excepting infants and the women. And of these there were gathered together as captives twelve hundred. And as for those that were slain at the taking of the city and in the former fights, they were numbered to be forty thousand. Vespasian gave order the city to be entirely demolished, and all the fortifications burnt down. So here we see just how bloody it was up north. Fire and blood. And so that is just running down through Judea. And so, you know, this is even before we've gotten to where they're around Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had warned about this before. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, so see how important it is to look at the history that right where Peter and Paul, John and James and all these men of God are speaking in the time frame there where Jesus had warned the things that were going on in that generation that they would see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, that there would not be one stone standing at that temple that all would be tore down that where you see the carcass there the eagles would be gathered well yeah they got rid of one eagle but they got 10 others that were devouring that carcass right there so i think that's great to look at the history well praise god we're going to continue in jesus uh staying faithful until the end uh, where he's going to say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your Lord. Praise God. I love you, and God bless you. In the name of Jesus.